Hello. So, uh, I am Quinn. You probably know me the best just because I am the host of the Board of Directors. Um, so, a few months ago, we took on the project of taking care of a southern alligator lizard. Um, so, I found this little critter um, in the door of our garage. That's where he was. That's where I was. He was right there. I decided, just, you know, since it's an opportunity, to uh, do a little bit of, uh, you know, citizen science. So this video will be separated into four parts, not four different videos, but four different like chapters or whatever, um, all documenting the care, handling, personality, and reproduction, and even decomposition of the species Elgaria multicarinata. So the four different um, chapters of the video will be separated by which chair people of the board uh, specifically uh, kind of uh, took it upon themselves to do the individual uh, uh, little parts of care and, and all that. However, if this subject matter uh, of DID uh, at all interests you, uh, I'll recommend checking out a list of channels that I will include in the description below. Uh, and with all that being said, enjoy the... Uh Enjoy the presentation. This totally did not take me several months to film. I used to be a surgeon, and let me tell you, the anatomy of an alligator lizard is just very divergent from what I'm used to. Hello, I'm known as Mayet. I am a member of the board of directors, and during our keeping of the southern alligator lizard, given the alias of Esau, uh, we learned a great deal about the species. Some of it was, granted, already documented in the public domain. However, I now strongly believe that the most efficient way to learn about a species is from first-hand experience. Assembling the enclosure for Esau was relatively easy. Measuring his, uh, mastering his husbandry was painless as we live in, in, a, in the environment he is used to. All we needed really was some newspaper cat litter for substrate, a water bowl, uh, half of an Amazon box for a hide, uh, a defunct reptile drinker uh, for another hide, and a couple paper towel rolls. A heat lamp would typically be recommended, but at the time we had a spare window that let sun stream in most of the day, so we just put his enclosure in front of it. Esau, as is true for all of his kin, are very small and very passionately insectivorous, uh, not to mention that they are movement-based hunters. You know how in Jurassic Park, they claim that dinosaurs can only see based off of movement. Absolutely still. This vision is based on movement. That's... That is very not true. But I can only guess the person who explained this concept to the writers meant was that the animal can only tell that something is alive based on movement. And this is true for many insectivorous species. Uh, whether they're reptiles or not, it has nothing to do with their level of eyesight. The thing is, this factor posed as a rather large hurdle when it came to caring for Esau. Uh, an alligator lizard's eyesight is in fact razor sharp, uh, as it must be for them to be scavengers in the wild, uh, especially in the tall grasses like they're used to. What perplexes me about this is that the movement of whatever prey items I put in front of him didn't seem to be enough. I put superworms, I put mealworms, uh, th those are really the only invertebrates we have an abundance of at the moment, put them all in front of him, which would turn into beetles long before he even gave them a hungry glance. And I worked very hard uh, to get these worms before keeping him. I never even tried breeding them before, uh, but the point is, I could tell he was getting hungrier and hungrier each passing day, uh, mostly because of his uh, rather disheveled look. The fact that he again and again refused to eat the mealworms I put in front of him, what was I going to do to keep him from dying of starvation? Well, I had a theory. The theory uh, the, the, the reason why reptiles can be finicky eaters sometimes is because of the unfamiliarity in their environment, right? Take ball pythons. When some folks have theirs go off food, what typically helps? 
uh, putting dried grass in the enclosure uh, to stimulate the ball python's native experience of food vibrating the grass. What about crested geckos? Ever notice how so many people's crested geckos almost refuse to eat the watermelon flavor? Watermelons are minimally grown in New Caledonia. Um, even if they are grown, they are floor-dwelling gourds with a hard shell. Uh, the average wild crested gecko goes their entire life without seeing them. Uh, much less tasting a watermelon. Uh, with that said, it's very likely that its smell, texture, flavor, um, everything, doesn't register to the Cresta Gecko as food. All right, we've established that reptiles favor things that are reminiscent of their homeland. Uh, what does that have to do with Esau? Well, mealworms and superworms aren't native to California. <laughs> I mean, how would they know that they're food? The, the decades and decades of their parents before them had never even tasted a mealworm, it is likely. So I thought, why don't we present an animal that is common in California? Uh, Esau consistently took the species Steatoda nobilis, Fulcus phalangioides, all right, uh, Menemerus bivitatus, Lepisma saccharinum, and Thermobia domestica. So, as you can tell, mostly house spiders, with the exception of silverfish and fire brats. Um, now with the feeding conundrum resolved, I naively thought this was it. It was going to be smooth sailing from now on. There was absolutely no reason for it not to be, right? If you've never had to deal with mites before, especially in reptile keeping, then consider yourself lucky. It's almost like trying to do homework based off of information you got when you skimmed a notebook. When you skimmed it, you kind of know what you're doing, but at the end of the day, you probably left some information out. You can call me Lenny. I'm from the board of directors, basically a uh, vice chairperson, you could go as far as to say. Um, and I dealt with a good lot of the uh, general rehabilitation stuff that we did for ESAL. Uh, and it was okay. It was okay. One goal of this whole project was mostly to be able to get ESAL to be socialized enough. Either uh, be able to handle handling or maybe even enjoy it um, like some of our guys do. Because we do have experience socializing reptiles um, and it's, yeah, yeah, we're, uh, I'd say we're moderately good at it, I'd say a little bit, you know, I mean, not to, you know, myself, you know, but I think, I think we're pretty good at it. Um, we've gotten quite a bit of experience doing that a total of six times. Six times. So one day, uh, I was picking up Esau, doing one of those, like, uh, handling session things that I like to do with them. And when I was holding him, I noticed like all along his scales was a was like a bunch of like little like black and white and some red even little guys just like scurrying around on him like little insects. Um, and now I, I'm not necessarily like em entomophobic fear of insects. Ah, uh, that's not me necessarily. But um, I'm I'm not a fan of of mites on me. So I was a little bit taken aback when I saw that he had a bunch, like an insane amount. So I tried not to freak out. I mean, like reptile mites aren't dangerous to humans, not really that dangerous to humans. Um, so my phobia is absolutely irrational, <laughs> I can assure you. Um, but it, it was still kind of like, whoa, you know? Um, so I put him back in his enclosure. And so I sat down and I thought like, what the hell am I gonna do? Oh my God, he's got mites everywhere. That means it's all over the enclosure. Oh, I hope it didn't get into any of my other enclosures. It didn't, don't worry, it didn't. Nobody else in the, in the, in the, in the room has mites. Not even me, that's great. After discovering that, um, the next step was to do like a full on like quarantine. I know, I know, I should have done this at the start. I know that that'll be the last time I don't quarantine a guy before introducing him to, you know, the, the, the main squad, right? What the plan was, was every day uh, I would change out the bedding in this new smaller enclosure, one more manageable and easy to, you know, switch out the decor for, um, to make sure that there's no like I don't know, to make sure that the mite population doesn't grow a whole lot, right? There will be no water bowl in the enclosure, mostly because um, less moisture makes it less likely for the mites to 
survive? I'm not actually sure. I <laughs> Okay, look, we looked into like a bunch of tutorials on how to get rid of mites and a bunch of people were like, oh yeah, do it this way, do it this way. So we're like, oh, okay, sure. And then I wrote it down and then we did it. Every day, usually in the morning, um, I would throw away the bedding, uh, replace it with new bedding and take Esau out of the enclosure and give him a little soak, right? Put him in some warm water, you know, um, and funnily enough, he, he can like float and swim. And whenever I see lizards swim, it's always so weird to me because like, that's just a little crocodile. And I know, I know crocodiles are closer related to birds than they are to lizards or whatever, but like they swim like they, oh my God. It is important to note that um, alligator lizards in general, especially these guys, um, the, uh, the, the southern ones, um, they are very uh, reclusive. They don't, they don't like handling. They don't really like people. Um, and they also don't really like each other. It was a bit of a challenge to get him to be okay with handling. Like, the amount of times I got bit by him... Okay, it wasn't that much. But I, I got bit by him like, I think two times? Three times. Three times. He, he was less inclined to bite when I had gloves on. Uh, like latex gloves and stuff. Which, I don't know why that would be the case. Maybe he can feel a difference in texture uh, of, of flesh versus uh, versus latex. I don't know. Either way, it was very interesting. Um, but the bites of a southern alligator lizard, no big deal. No. They, it bleeds a little bit. I can't say it doesn't break the skin. <laughs> but uh, just put some chlorhexidine on it um, and you'll be okay. Oh, also, before I forget, um, for, for some reason, lizards, especially like Esau, love paper towel rolls. Like I would put a single paper towel roll in it, he would almost never leave. It's, it's like crazy, he loves them so much. So, after only like four weeks of doing this whole quarantine mite thing, the whole thing basically fixed itself. He didn't really have any noticeable mites. Uh, a lot of his demeanor seemed much more uh, excited. Uh, you know, he had a lot more energy to him, uh, which was very cool and fun. Um, so we decided hmm, we could move him back into a uh, into a normal enclosure, uh, and so we did. And uh, it 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 was normal for a few days afterwards. Uh, but then one day we woke up and. Uh, <laughs> So, it turns out that Esau is not only female and not male as we previously thought, uh, mostly because we misunderstood the criteria for the sexual dimorphism of the species, but also Esau laid uh, not one, not two, but three individual eggs. Any production of any eggs at all leaves the potential for the eggs to, of course, hatch after incubation, because that would be some of the very few in the world first um, captive-born southern alligator lizards. The laying of these eggs uh, immediately brought the question forth, which was, how did this happen? In a lot of species of uh, animals with cloacas, that is a lot of birds and a lot, and mo basically all reptiles, um, the females of the species tend to retain the semen of previous mating sessions uh, for up to four to eight years later. It's one of the confidants that Esau had probably uh, had, had previously mated with, um, she probably retained his semen for multiple years or multiple months. Believe it or not, this is actually a uh, an ongoing issue within the snake breeding community just because of the fact that if you pair up uh, female A with male A one year and then the next year you pair up female A with male B, then the eggs that you get on that second year um, are likely to still have some of the leftover semen from male A in there. So you'll get a, 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 an entire clutch of eggs that's just a mishmash of genetics of, uh, combining both uh, suitors, which is uh, very troublesome if you're specifically breeding for the intent of uh, hunting for specific morphs. But I digress. I forgot to introduce myself. I am known as Glaber. I'm a part of the board of directors, right? I'm a chairperson. Um, and I was mostly responsible for the uh, egg incubation period 
uh, with for ESA when ESA was in our care. Even though that was my primary responsibility when it came to tending to ESA, um, it was rather simple. All you really need is a location that is consistent in temperature all day, every day, or for the most part, that doesn't fluctuate too wildly. Um, a closet was what we used. Uh, a lot of people actually use closets. Um, and for the lay box that we used was this old um, plastic Rubbermaid uh, container. All you really need to do is put some substrate in it. A lot of people use perlite or vermiculite. We just use paper towels because we don't have any perlite or vermiculite. Um, we laid down uh, a few rolls of paper towel, a few sheets of paper towel, uh, sprayed it, kept it humid, um, and left it in the closet for the entirety of gestation. Although our attempts at, at during this time were not necessarily fruitful, um, theoretically th this is a good idea. Th th theoretically this is an all right idea. If you have some sort of uh, moist substrate that is more uh, effective than for instance a paper towel roll, definitely use that as a pa paper towel roll is just the, the poor man's vermiculite. So it's it's difficult to surmise the general conditions that the eggs of southern alligator lizards have to be in for it to be optimal temperatures and uh, j just general conditions. But what I feel to be the best, uh, the, the, the best conditions that you wanna aim for are ones that mirror, closely mirror uh, those of, for instance, uh, California or in more more uh, more generally uh, North America as a whole moderate humidity and uh, set around 75 degrees Fahrenheit we initially when caring for Esau um, kept mixing up the species of southern alligator lizards and northern alligator lizards the major difference because the species do look almost identical um, in coloration the major difference between them is that uh, northern alligator lizards give live birth, whereas southern alligator lizards uh, are oviparous, meaning they lay eggs. Um, within around one month and 15 days uh, after uh, the laying of the eggs, um, the eggs succumbed to a black mold. I'm not 100% uh, sure on what species of mold it was uh, that took them over, but anyone who's ever incubated eggs before is likely familiar with the species. Either way, they molted over, um, and the likelihood of the embryos within surviving that is very low, at least with the amount of mold that, that were on them at the time. Though, as much as that is uh, very not great news, uh, even worse news is, so Isa was struggling a lot with parasites that he got from um, the insects that we had been feeding him. And because of that, his physical uh, state had been slowly, or I suppose rather quickly, uh, deteriorating. We tried resume, uh, resuming the initial quarantine that we had done to get rid of the, the mites in the first place. Um, and mostly just giving him repeated soaks, baths, you know, things of that nature. Um, and hopefully from that, his uh, state would uh, fix itself. Hopefully he would get better. Depending on the soil, the temperature conditions, the amount of humidity, and the species of lizard, it'll generally take around 30 days for a, an adult lizard to fully decompose. The initial plan was to perform a dissection on Esau and then bury him in the ground and come back 30 days and hopefully the skeleton will have uh, emerged and the surrounding scales were, would have decomposed. The thing is, when I initially sat down and began recording the dissection, um, I couldn't do it. I couldn't find it within myself to actually cut him open and uh, do all of the other things that people typically do within a dissection. I wasn't prepared to just flay him on the spot. There was a part of me 
no matter what I did, no matter how many times I told myself otherwise, there was a part of me that was convinced that he was still alive and that if I were to be performing the dissection, that would be hurting him. Because a vivisection, that's when you perform a dissection on a live animal, is commonly understood to be a very inhumane practice. Um, and I would never be able to find it within myself to do that. And so th the prospect that that might be a thing that I do unknowingly was just too much. I, I could not do it. So, uh, of course, I decided to skip that step. The bi a biopsy is not necessary anyway. I, I already know what caused his death. It was very obviously internal parasites. Um, so the next step would be, of course, to perform the burial. So I did. It was an admittedly shallow grave because the dirt that surrounds our house is very packed. It was somewhat a burial, something that the decomposers of the environment would be able to access. At the time of recording, it's been around nine months since the initial burial. Um, so how does he look? Th there was not very much left. All that was left was a completely hollowed out tail. Not even a full tail. Um, no skeleton within it. Uh, it, it, it was just half of his tail. It's especially strange because bones are typically what a decomposer leaves behind, but it seemed like the bones and the sinews and flesh and musculature underneath the calcified scales were... that's what was eaten. But the bone... the, 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 the scales themselves were the only thing they left behind. So a majority of his body probably was already picked away by small mammals uh, and small birds, or large birds too, um, just because of how ripped up and kind of disheveled the remaining bit of tail looks. But all I saw were scales. There was no skeleton, and definitely not a skull, uh, which it would have been nice just to know what the skeleton of a southern alligator lizard looks like, because you don't see those every day. Um, in fact, very, very few days you actually do see those. Even if I am left feeling a little saddened by not ha receiving the outcome that I was looking forward to, it's, it's alright. Proteins within his body have been returned back into the earth, and the carbon cycle continues. What was the point of this whole excursion? What is, what's the purpose of opening yourself up to the world when it'll inevitably chew you up and spit you back out? Well, to put it succinctly, the experiences I had with Esau were in and of themselves the point. I learned so much. I really did. I learned so much just, just watching his behavior as, as, as an alligator lizard, just running around and how he interacts with his environment and manipulates his environment. And not only that, but in general, as a whole, I learned a lot about the wildlife native to California in the wild. I will be able to perfectly match the species of southern alligator lizard if I see them again. And I will, I will, because they are very common here. Um, even if the IUCN says that that is on a, a downward spiral. The, the bigger point I'm trying to tell you is that the amount that you learn about a singular species when you keep them is... It, I mean, to, to lack of a better way to put it, it's priceless. It is. When you watch them eat, defecate, mess up the enclosure you make them, you know, all, all of the different uh, elements of keeping a reptile, you learn to memorize every fold of their body, every curve, every one of their needs, you know. Uh, anticipating every movement that they will make just so that you can know how to best take care of them. And doing that makes you almost fall in love with the species, not in a, a, a weird way particularly, M more so just... Th there's just a kind of bond that you grow with that animal that that isn't replaceable. Even if the animal of inevitably dies within your care and you will definitely blame yourself for a good part of it, even if there is very little you can do, there's just a part of it that helps you fall more in love with 
the world around you just because of how much you learn about that species. The thing about Esau, as funny as it is to admit, is I really did love him as a friend. And I know that is definitely silly because, uh, of course, southern alligator lizards have no understanding of friendship that is comparable to any sapient species or any uh, primate in general. But even so, I became very emotionally attached to him just taking care of him. And even though I was distraught to see him go when he did, and I arguably was not prepared for it to happen when it did, if I hadn't opened myself up to it at all, then I wouldn't have been able to reap the benefits. So I may or may not use this part, but either way, I would just like to say thank you very much for watching. Uh, I don't know how long this video is going to end up being, but if it's long, then that is a even bigger thank you for watching. It was very difficult to make this video just because different people front at different times, and even when they do front, then it's like, well, do I even want to record right now? You know, you know how it is. Well, you might not, but if you do, then you know how it is. Oh yes, um, another thing I would like to mention is that masking is usually when all the different alters attempt to uh, pretend to be the host so that people get the impression that they're not a system, they're just one, one person. We're still trying to get over the general habit of masking. I mean, you, al you already know, if you saw our previous video, you already know our stance on people uh, speculating on the truthfulness of somebody having a disorder. So if if you take it upon yourself to compare each individual alter presented in this video, um, and say, oh, they're not, they're 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 too similar, therefore are not actually individual people, then um, how about how about you take our individual balls? and you put them in your mouth.